Junior John was the son of Steve and Jeanette Peters Papamon. He grew up on a farm northwest of Hospers and attended the Hospers Christian Grade School and Western Christian High School in Hull. Following his graduation, he worked for Ziggers Carpentry in Hospers until enlisting in the United States Marine Corps in 1956. He was stationed in Japan where he operated heavy equipment, building roads and bridges, and was honorably discharged in 1958. On June 3, 1959, he was united in marriage to Janice Steiner at the First Christian Reformed Church in Hospers. They made their home in Hospers, and Junior worked for Culligan Water Service in Sheldon, and he and Janice briefly operated the country kitchen. Junior also worked for Russell's Ready Mix in Orange City, Fens Dairy in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Wells Blue Bunny in Lamar's. He then accepted a position as an insurance agent with Prince Insurance in Sheldon. In 1985, he established Papamon Insurance Agency in Hospers and later earned his realty license as well. Junior retired in 2012. It makes me tired to hear all those things. He retired in 2012. He and Janice operated J&J consignment in Hospers. And Junior continued to sell real estate until 2015. Junior was a lifelong member of the First Christian Reformed Church in Hospers, where he was baptized, served as a deacon, elder, and cadet leader, sang with a men's quartet, and played in the church slow pitch softball team until the age of 50. He was also a member of the Reuter American Legion Post volunteered on the Hospers ambulance team, pitched for the Hospers fast pitch softball team, and served on the board of directors for the Hospers Christian School, Unity Christian High School, Dort College, the Sheldon Hospital, and the Pioneer Memorial Home. His most enjoyable activities were fishing and vacationing at various resorts in Minnesota with his family, whom he loved dearly. Survivors include his wife of more than 62 years, Janice of Hospers, four children and their spouses, Jeff and Don Papama of Bacchus, Minnesota, and Jackie and Del Wallen, Jim and Lori Papama, and Joe and Gina Papama, all of Orange City. Thirteen grandchildren, twelve great-grandchildren, a sister and her husband, Carol and Jerry DeVries, a brother and his wife, Howard and Joyce Papama, Two sisters-in-law, Donna Papama and Sandy Stite, a brother-in-law and his wife, Alvin and Julie Stite, and many nephews and nieces. In addition to his parents and parents-in-law, Ralph and Martha Stite, he was preceded in death by two brothers, John Jr. Papama in infancy and Roger Papama. We're gathered today to remember the gift that God gave to us in the light and the memories that we still have through Junior Pablo. And to remember, most importantly, the Lord Jesus Christ, the gift God gave to Junior in salvation through Jesus and to all who believe in his name. Janice, and Jeff and Don, Ellen and Jackie, Tim and Lori. Gina and Joe, all of you. Aging took its toll on Junior, didn't it? In these last days, we're now separated from him by death, and we cry. We should. It means you loved him. He's missing this family reunion. He would have enjoyed it. And we'll miss it, loss of sadness, aim for us. But we find a shelter in Jesus Christ. God sent his only son to live a perfect life for the sin of Junior Papa and all who are his own. The sin which brought our death. And that Jesus died as a punishment in place of our sin to make us right with God and at peace of him again. He rose for a resurrection and new life 
so that all who believe will be reunited with him and with each other beyond the grave, shining even like today. So let us read these promises. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is by grace that you've been saved through faith in Jesus Christ, and this not for yourself, the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. And John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We're going to sing together then from the great songbook, These Promises, Number 462, 462, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, 462, All the Verses. listen again. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You 
Prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our Lord Jesus, in John chapter 10, said, I am the good shepherd. And in John chapter 14, he said, in my father's house. Isn't that where Psalm 23 ended? I live in the house of the Lord. Jesus said, in my father's house, of many mansions. The old King James said, many rooms are newer translations. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Our comfort is in the word of the Lord. All praise and thanks be to our God. At this time, a son and then a son in law will share a few words. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Uh, Dad's cup did overflow because of you. It uh, was no secret that Hospers had a huge place in his heart. He loved to be. And uh, I'll try to get through this. <clears throat> so, uh, as John said, Dad was a fighter. All of you knew that. He wasn't scared to tell you what he thought once in a while. Sometimes I <laughs> would get a little over the top. I can remember him hollering at the rat or the hump once in a while. And thinking, Dad, just be quiet. But in the back of my mind, it still is good to know he's there fighting for me. So that was one of the, the things that I um, really appreciated about him. Um, he was a giver. Um, some of you experienced that personally, I think. And uh, I know as a little kid, he would teach us how to give. You know, he would give us money and he'd get in the uh, collection plate. But then as a <clears throat> We were older and keep hearing stories about him helping other people. And it really touched my heart and formed, I think, part of my personality. So uh, it was something he did. He didn't have to do with words, he did with his life. Um, like I said, he wasn't perfect. He was far from that. Uh, I can. <laughs> Howard and probably these spirited conversations we had at around Grandpa and Grandpa's table once in a while. Uh, I can remember Grandpa walking up and, and leaving the table after a Sunday morning service because it got so heated. But you know, they, all the pop and the boys kind of had that same thing. And uh, so they weren't scared to let you know what they, they felt. And yet, he always recentered himself in trust. Um, I would talk to him about, I'd call him and say, thanks for being a good dad. And he'd go, I don't know, John. I did a very good job. And I'd always tell him, you know, there are a lot of kids today that I work with that don't have dads, don't have dads that care of them. And then I took it for granted when I was a little kid. I really did. And the older I got, the more important I became. And so I think I, I really wanted to encourage all the young kids here, kids like Brett, not a kid anymore, but don't ever forget how important that is. Your kids are going to. Appreciate that so much as you grow older. They may be not now. They may not like you for a while. They will appreciate what you've done for them. 
Um, I wrote a letter to Dad. This was quite a few months ago before he, he really started coming to that. I heard this on the radio station. Uh, a gentleman was encouraging people to write a letter instead of write, uh, reading it at your parents' funeral to actually read it to them. And so I did this and had the opportunity to, to have Dad hear this. When I was little, I would look at you and wish I could be as big and strong and confident as you were. You were what I wanted to be in so many ways. But then I started getting older, and I thought I had all the answers. Of course, I was way off. I didn't take long to figure that out, that you were much wiser than me, and gave me a good goal to shoot for. So the older I get, the more I realize that I've been blessed to have a dad like you. You were not perfect, but there were so many things that you did that set the bar high for me. Here are some of the things that got to witness being your son. I learned to work hard. I learned to suffer gracefully when God was poor. I learned to love one woman. I learned to give time to my kids. I learned to trust God and follow Christ to the test of my ability. I learned to sacrifice for others. I learned what really was important in life. I always felt loved. I always knew you would be there for our family. I learned to love baseball, hunting, fishing. I learned to be a giver. I learned to show respect to all, but to earn others' respect. I learned how to stock a milk cooler in the store. I learned how to move along and work in the garden. And I learned how to grow old gracefully. Thank you, Dad, for this and so much more. I love you. And I look forward to spending my many days together. In the future, I would also like to thank my brothers and sister, they always take care of that. I couldn't be there. He was a lot. Thank you.
know, Governor, or uh, however you know, this isn't the first time that we've played a box of soldiers for us. And today, the presentation of the flag by you just brings great leader character. Uh, while it could not have been easy, it will always be remembered. And Mom, thanks for asking me to do this. Say a few words. As we sound like that's life. It's been quite a couple weeks. We have shared so many special moments together. As kids, grandchildren, great grandchildren, all able to strong dad with our words of love, exchange smiles of gratitude before he gradually became less and less responsive. We're all grateful and comforted by the wonderful care you received before becoming, before being welcomed home into heaven, where we know you heard these words from Matthew 25 3. Well done, good and faithful sir. But the rest of the verse is this. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share the joy of your work. The greatest gift that we can all give you now is that the assurance of knowing we can be with you again someday. So, Mom, with the dignity and grace that you've shown us this week, uh, when the decisions got more difficult and the restful sleep needed became less and less, is a testament to your own mind of faith and hope. That both you and Dad have put in the spirit together. But Junior and I have a story. A lot of people don't know the story. But more importantly, it's God's story. And I don't want to share that today. You see, because growing up as a young child in Sheldon during the 1960s, only God knew then that I would grow up and marry the young man's daughter. <laughs> It was only after the days of that I would learn that it was Junior who had made those deliveries in our neighborhood. And it was my friends and I who were always trying to get to ride down the street on the back of the milk truck. Sometimes he hollered at us. Other times I think he let us get on for a short ride just so he could hit the brakes and teach us a lesson. <laughs> but we never caught on to that. I also now know that one of those kids riding in that truck from time to time is None of this was previously shared with me, even when I started my career in law enforcement and Dad became my insurance agent through Prince Insurance Agency. But Jack and I were introduced by a mutual friend, and we began the in and to keep this story uh, somewhat in perspective, we were engaged after six months and married after a year. You want to stress out Dad? <laughs> I did that. Well, if asking for a second date, she said, sure. Church is at 7 o'clock Sunday night. Uh, that wasn't a deterrent for me. Uh, unless Matthew tells me later today that it's meant to be a deterrent. I don't know. I don't think so. So I agreed. And, uh, you know, I always believed in God. I just had no definitive reason why I should. I just did. I just believed in God. Was there a question in my life when I raised a But uh, it was there. As I got to know the family, as a, as a father and a respected person in the community, also as a church elder. I would go to church and he would often direct the conversation out of asking, How'd you like that sermon? Do you have any questions? Or he would ask what I thought about a certain statement that was made or a specific scripture that was read. It was always amazing to me that that same scripture in those same thoughts. Uh, seemed to be read right before I get. So I think Dad was just giving me that extra nudge to say it's a good word. Apply to your life. In time, Dad let me know that uh, the pastor would like to meet with me for a Bible study if I was interested. I thought the two would be hand in hand. I was interested in Jackie, so I'd be interested in the Bible study. I now know that Bible study to be the Bible for Dad. <laughs> The exchanges continued and relationships were put quickly, and uh, they added the entire family. Um, you know, even finding out that uh, they had brothers, Roger and Howard, and my dad. That's a nice moment for anybody, baby. Let me tell you, <laughs> I'm finding you into this family. Now I know my dad. Uh, anyway, this extended family, I mean, it was, it was an opportunity for me to experience uh, holidays and special occasions. Uh, most routinely, the week we practice on Sunday morning coffee, and then Sunday dinner, and then Sunday evening coffee, and then lunch, and 
The Sundays was a big, I was more out on Sunday. I was ready to go back to work on Monday. It was crazy. But with Dan, and because of his family, I saw my first professional baseball game. I saw the first birthday cake since being a junior. Took my first vacation to a resort where I, I, I drank my first beer in a fishing boat. That was my first beer, my first fishing boat. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, today as a father and a grandfather, I learned from that that concerns and wisdom can be shared by someone or someone. It's something as simple as a prayer. I both Dad and Pastor knew how serious Dad can ever get. I'll never forget Joe. <laughs> Five years old at the time, right in front of me and his parents. So Jack, if you like better to stop or that over at <laughs> I'll leave out the name of the protect the innocent. No doubt, no doubt they had one of that same answer. <laughs> it would have been important. But it was that same Joe that figured it out and shared a game with us. And the game that I was present. In his kindergarten class. And I see him just on sister. After spending time together, and sometimes included the ride along in my control car, the pastor said to ask me one day if there was any reason that I could think of for not receiving Christ as my first home over Savior. And I could not think of any. So the old person in the church, just across the way, I knelt with the pastor, and he led me through what has been referred to as a sinner's prayer. I soon made a public affirmation and took him to my faith, standing ready in this church on this platform. I just remember that beforehand, doing all that, they actually me the questions that would be asked from the back of the Psalter table, and let me take it as a review and preparing to meet with the elders. I still have the ability to do it. So began my faith journey that has included a wine leader, a head counselor, catechism teacher, Christian school board member, a journey that has led us to Catholic Church in our city and turns as a deacon and elder. It has also been my privilege to serve as the executive director of the International Ministry and teach biblical truth and share the gospel. A journey that continues, a journey that has not been about mistakes, difficulties, and hardships, but a journey that has in no way let the challenges faced be outnumbered by the many joys, affirmations, blessings, and the lasting peace of mind and comfort that God has let me know through that. You can only find a good relationship with Him. Son of the Holy Spirit. A journey began in my life because they had some purpose and value in a sinner like me. A man who took me into his family, not as a biological son, not even as an adopted son, but as a child of God to be spiritually born again. I once shared this long already quote with Dad, and you'll see why he liked it. Many people go through life wondering if they made a difference. But the Marines don't have that problem. Today, I'm not a different person because Dad was a Marine. I'm a different person because Dad was a follower of Jesus Christ. While we wouldn't describe Dad as an evangelist, I'm sure he was influenced by his own father, Steve, who was fond of, fond of this and saying, even posting it on his retirement home book. If you meet me and forget me, you've lost nothing. If you meet Jesus and forget him, you've lost everything. Father God, Lord, your mercy and grace are renewed each day in our lives. Not just when we feel young, strong, and equipped, but when we are weak, tired, and often feel inadequate. This is one of those times. Every time our days all joy for your glory. By your spirit, we grow in knowing, loving, and serving you more and more each day. Dad, we love that too. Today, we pray that you are glorified. Dad's life and legacy is honored, and that together we are edified by life well lived. In the wonderful name of that Savior and ours, in Jesus' name we pray. So, your farmer's safety. <laughs> <laughs> if I need to talk around, I call. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Dallas. Thank you, children. 
for the for being a legacy. We're gonna sing in your uh, folder, Safe in the Arms of Jesus, the song Safe in the Arms of Jesus. Let's sing at this time. to visit Janice Jr. by himself a few times in the hospital, sometimes the family, other family was there. I came to his bedside at the hospital 11 days ago and I asked the family gathered, what can we say to a man who is a fighter? So Jeff, we kind of agreed on that a little bit, fighter. And uh, Junior kind of, he was conscious at the time. You know, what do you think? And now I read the obituary. A man who fought for his place in society, learning carpentry, water treatment, food service. Who fought to learn the ready mix and dairy industry, who worked at Wells Blue Money and at insurance and at realty. Who did it to fight for his family, I believe, to provide for you. Who did it to pay for Christian education. <laughs> he cared. Who did it to share with those new in town. He did it, not for status, not to have the biggest house, the nicest car, but to be able to get into the kingdom. He fought to bless Christ's church as a deacon, an elder, a cadet leader. Who fought off old age to play softball, even 
of his kids' generation, serving school boards, college, hospital boards, who fought for his country as a U.S. Marine. And who also fought the deterioration of falls. Took a tumble in the garden, took tumbles in other places. See, last five years, Jack, I think he said, were really quite hard, weren't they? What do you say to such a player? How about you say, good fight, Junior? Good fight. You've been a source of inspiration and hope. The family asked me to consider that scripture that I brought that day, a scripture for fighters, 2 Timothy 4. I read it with Junior and the family. I'm going to read it this morning. This afternoon, I guess I better not read it this morning, or you're going to be wondering how we got there again. 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8. Apostle Paul wrote, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is a store for me to crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You know, Junior had a stand up on a, on a that stand there, and he nodded when I said that. That that fit. Now the Apostle Paul's fight was no less than Junior's fight. Here's what Paul wrote in Corinthians. He said, five times I received the 40 lashes, minus one. Three times beat with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day floating on the sea. I was constantly on the move, in danger from rivers and bandits and Jews and Gentiles, in the country, in the city. I was attacked by false brothers. I labored and toiled off without sleep. I knew hunger and thirst, weakness and temptation. And besides all this, Paul says, I've always been filled with concern for the church. You ever have a husband who's concerned for the church? Had to be one of those leadership roles. And as Paul thought of all the struggles and trials, he would say, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. I was Paul thinking about this because presently Paul was in prison. Because presently he was awaiting Roman execution. Like Junior Paul knew, I'm gonna die. This is it, this is the end. But a million women, look at it. This is what Paul said in verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. This is a profession of faith. And it's two images. It's the image of a drink offering and the image of the ship. First, the image of a drink offering. The Old Testament Jew, Paul, a member of the Jewish community, knew that the drink offering was poured out at the end of the sacrifice. Often it was wine. Paul sees his life as a drink offering, meaning what? Meaning the sacrifices that I've made for Christ are finally reaching their conclusion. And it's time for the drink offering to be poured. To mark the end of sacrifices, and remember that sacrifice is a willing thing. When someone came to offer a sacrifice, it was their testimony, I give willingly. No one forced Paul. Start to finish, Jesus, my life is yours. And in a sense, isn't that what Jesus said when he died? Father, into your hands I give my spirit. I pour it out. But the second image is the ship. Not only the faith to give our lives back to God in our dying days, the image of a ship, not an offering, but a ship. The time Paul says has come for my departure. The technical word for departure here is an interesting one. It means to loosen or to untie. It was always used when a ship was about to embark on a journey. Untie, loosen, depart for the excitement ahead. Paul looked forward to the future. I was with Junior in the hospital. I asked if he was hurting. He had his hand up there and he mumbled something. And it was to the effect of monotonous. 
It's time. Enough. And so be prepared to depart. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.23, to depart and be with Christ is better by far. Junior Bill. Paul's present prison term, Junior's hospice care, they both met the end of a life of sacrifice and bring an offering poured out to God to set sail. Receive Jesus. Yet Paul surveyed the present, caused him to look to the past. He was fighting. He said, I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. We would do a great disservice to the Apostle Paul if we read the list of all the things he said he went through in Corinthians, or all the things Junior went through and said, I wonder who had more hardship on earth. They were just kind of comparing. No. No, he was not looking at this from a worldly point of view. He was thinking about what was to come. Paul says, I have fought the good fight of the faith elsewhere. First Timothy 6, 12, I fought for Jesus. I fought against people who did not understand him, their errors and heresies, against the evil one and sin, to win souls to Jesus and to correct doctrine that was not right. Paul says, I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Kept the faith. And Paul's a, a prisoner, as he said in Rome. Soldiers are keeping him, that's the word we use here. What a boring duty. You ever think of those guards with the What are we doing keeping this old guy? This old man who keeps talking about some Jesus. Why do we have to keep him under lock and key? Isn't there somebody more interesting? But they guard him anyway. Well, like the Roman soldiers, Paul uses the same word. He says, I have guarded, I have kept. The truth about Jesus, his virgin birth, his perfect life, his atoning sacrifice for my sin, and his resurrection and his promised return, I kept that faith. And I have not let it go. Neither would you hear. He fought to hold on to Jesus. Only one thing counted for Paul or Junior, and it counts for every true believer, whether or not we kept the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus, you see, he's the only true soldier, the only true warrior, who has sincerely loved his God and has sincerely loved his neighbors and given himself as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Through temptation, through trial, through pain, and impending death, he never loved to secure our salvation. It was he Paul was looking to. The faith is about him. It was he Junior looked to in his life. I have fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith in Jesus. Like Paul Jr. and the family, I like this day, I want this verse to be said because this fight was the only thing that could explain a life like Junior's. No doubt he experienced times in church leadership where all he could do is pray. What do we do in this situation? What should we do? Lord, help us. Cam Jr., no doubt, saw his failures and shortcomings. He wasn't perfect. We heard. But he looked at Jesus' perfect life in his place. That was where his faith lied. Junior didn't quit. After many falls and pains and hospital stays, stays I saw him about four weeks ago, ambling to this church right here. I was up in front again. And he got here, he drove you here. He made his way in. He focused forward, fighting to get to hear those wonderful words of life and righteousness about Jesus to sing again. He didn't move fast, but he moved forward to again sing about his Lord. That one soldier of salvation mattered so much. We're going to sing about it in just a moment. This song, How Great Thou Art, it says, When I think that God is so not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden, gladly bearing, 
He let him die to take away my sin? Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. This is my junior, the fight of the faith. You kept the faith in Jesus. But lastly, Paul turned to the future. Not a present drink on the of departure, not a past fight, but a future crown. As his body wound down, Junior's hope increased. Every Christian must know this. The Apostle Paul did. He said, Now there's a store for me to crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me, but not only to me, also to all who will vote for his appearing. Paul's faith anticipated the destination where his ship would finally reach the shore. His soul would land in heaven with Jesus. But standing before the Lord, the Apostle Paul, imagine Jesus reviewing his fight and saying, Well done. It's good fun. Here's your crown. Here's your reward. Think about it. What does that mean? It means death isn't the end. For the Christian, there's a greater blessing after death. There's life. Because Jesus rose to bless his people alive. Forever. Life for Paul, life for Junior, and all who believe. What's the reward then? This crown of righteousness? Well, the last thing here to consider is that the Apostle Paul saw the Greek runners who would fight, who would strive, who would run, who would wrestle for the end and the victory, crowned with a wreath of plant material. Now, everyone knew the crown itself didn't have much value. It was symbolic of victory. It was a symbol. And the same is true for us as Christians. The crown will receive a symbol of victory. But the most important is who gives the crown. In the Greek Empire, it was the emperor or the mayor who would crown the victor personally. By grace, we know that Christ himself will give the crown of victory for a life that serves him. Those who begin to crown receive greater things, much more valuable. They receive victory over sin, over guilt, over evil and death and sickness, over the worst bumps and bruises, the most awful disease, over discouragement, over depression, these are totally victorious when they meet Jesus, and he gives them the gift of eternal life. As Junior became weaker, that hope increased. Anyone who watched it should be blessed by a faithful party. God gave Junior a drink offering and departure mentality, and after a long sacrifice, he set sail for glory. No more fight there, a peaceful day of victory, and well done. So before I close, let me ask you, what are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? Are you fighting for popularity, status, few possessions, a little more money, early retirement? What are you fighting for? Are you fighting for these things, or are you fighting to see Jesus and receive the crown for a life of faith? Will he say someday, I never knew you? Or, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of your master. Good fight against sin, against temptation, against the love of the world, to love me more. Here's your time. The answer depends on one thing. It depends on your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're fighting, you're running, you're keeping, all of us have to do again. Fight for Jesus, run for Jesus, keep to Jesus, and faith in him. It's Jesus you must know or your ship will run aground and sink into departure and hell. Remember, death is not the end. My hope and prayer is that you will meet Paul's judge and yours and hear Jesus say, you fought the good fight to love me. You ran to follow me. 
You trusted me. Here is your crown. Good fight, Junior. Good fight. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we miss Junior. We thank you for his faith. Please strengthen Janice, the family, and good friends who must adjust now to an empty chair, an empty space in their lives. Yet we thank you for the hope of the gospel that looms before us and fills our hearts. The day of reunion with all of your people. We thank you that those who you give the gift of faith can hold on to Jesus who fought for our souls to take us back from sin and death to live forever to a reward for all who are his. We thank you again that Junior held on to that hope, that he fought to teach it to us and others to live on obedience on the softball field and at home in his dealings with neighbors, if imperfectly, wanting to please you who gave him Jesus' perfection as a gift. Please enable us to sacrifice the things of this world for you and to look forward to weighing anger after we fought the last doubt and sin when we will see Junior and your glory and receive a crown in your presence. Here is help us. We pray in the name of the soldier of our salvation. Your son Jesus. Amen. We have an opportunity to turn our great song books, number 483. 483. As we do that, let's sing all the verses of 483.
see so many here to support me, has it? And uh, as we're going to be eating that meal, we're going to do that immediately. And you might say, well, we need to pray before we eat a meal. Junior was probably that important, wouldn't it? And we're going to do that in just a moment. We're going to pray that God bless that. And then we're going to hear a solo by Mies Arbstein. What a day that will be. So uh, after you hear that, after the family is possessed out, go right to eating. Let's pray again. Our Father in heaven, how great we are. We trust you to provide what we need each day to live and to fight that fight of faith. You give us your word and your spirit, your promises and presence. Please guide and guard Janice and the family as they continue their earthly journey. Give them strength and also us as you give us our daily bread so that we may be strengthened to live for you until the day when you visibly open that feast table in glory where Jesus will be at the head of the table, of which this communion table here in front of the church was a faint reflection on the day when there is no more pain, crying, or pain, no hunger either in your presence. Until then again, Lord, bless us and keep us. Make your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. Turn your face toward us and give us your peace. For Jesus' sake, amen.